Well, beloved, what are your plans for the rest of the day? I'm betting that on a nice June Sunday when it's not too hot and it's not supposed to rain, there's a fair amount of yard work on the agenda for many people. And if it isn't yard work, it's housework or catching up on work work or whatever there may be that hangs out there that we're going to do. Now, we always can find ways to fill up what otherwise look like empty hours, can't we? Before I was ordained, I was very proud that I got all of my laundry done for the week before church on Sunday morning, and I always did my grocery shopping on the way home from church on Sunday. You would think that now that I do what I do, I would be different and I would be very carefully Sabbatarian, but even as I was walking here this morning, when I should have been thinking about what I was going to say, I was already planning out everything I was going to do this afternoon. How much further along can I be on the week if I'll just work for a couple of hours after I come back from lunch? You know how that goes. And yet, in the back of all of our heads, perhaps there ought to be just a little voice saying, well, what about that whole Sabbath thing? It's right there in the commandments. We read it this morning in, in the Old Testament lesson. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And there was no question originally what that meant, and indeed, right down to today, Observant Jews still keep it in the way you might suppose, by being very careful not to do anything that counts as work. I can recall when I was getting my doctorate in Pittsburgh, I lived in a neighborhood with two churches and 12 synagogues. <clears throat> on Saturday morning, on the main street in this neighborhood, you would see people walking to the synagogue because they couldn't drive. But they were also wearing their prayer books in a bag around their neck. And I inferred, I never had the courage to ask anyone, but I inferred that that was because they couldn't carry it. But if they wore it in a bag around their neck, it was wearing it, not carrying it. So something that was absolutely essential for worship, to have your prayer book, even that you couldn't carry on the Sabbath. So there are varying levels of intensity, I suppose, in the way this is interpreted. And certainly rabbis for several thousand years have spent a great deal of their time helping the faithful of Israel interpret what that rule might be. And yet, even from the beginning, there were flaws and holes in the system. You can imagine going to a culture that's made up mostly of farmers and saying you can't work one day a week. Well, what are you going to do if you have animals? You can't tell them don't eat or drink today, it's the Sabbath. Come back tomorrow. What if you take care of sick people? You can't tell them, don't be sick today, it's Sabbath, come back tomorrow. There are always going to be things that you have to do for compassionate reasons, for reasons that are immediately apparent on what is otherwise supposed to be a day with no work. And that's all very well, but then you can see how that becomes a little bit of a slippery slope. And what is perhaps okay becomes even more perhaps what we're going to do anyway. Think about our culture in, in modern times. I, I don't know about you, in the past 15 years that I have been ordained, I have never gone on vacation and not taken my phone with me. I can't think of a time when I want, went on vacation and did not answer at least one email or one voicemail. Well, it'll just take a minute. I'll, I'll do it. You know how that works. How many times are you on the lawn tractor or on the, on the beach or in the mountains in a tent someplace in the sticks and an email comes up on your phone? You think, oh, I can't ignore this. Where is our Sabbath in the 21st century, dear friends? Do we have one? What does it mean anymore to rest? I'm not going to stand here and, 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 and scold you or lecture you because I'm certainly no better. I'm probably worse. I talked to somebody after 8 o'clock this morning as I was walking out, and he was asking me questions about the Sabbath. And I was saying, well, the first thing I'm going to do when I'm done with this service is go into my office, take my stole off, and pick up my phone. And in that moment, I was convicted out of my mouth, even though I knew what I was doing at the time. The Sabbath continues to be something we need to think about, but it needs to be something that we recognize for what it truly is. It's so easy for it to get out of hand and become something that's just mechanical. I am old enough to remember a time in Pennsylvania, and I'm pretty sure in Delaware also, where on the Sabbath, on Sunday, you might be able to buy gasoline, but you shouldn't expect to buy anything else. When I was in 
my last year of seminary at Yale, this is only 15 years ago, in Connecticut. You had the odd sight of going into a grocery store on Sunday in Connecticut and finding that you could buy anything except they had pulled down shades over the beer coolers because you couldn't buy beer on Sunday. Everything else in the store was fine, just not those two, two aisles. I don't know why. Worse than that, and becoming even more cynical about it, when I was in North Carolina years ago, uh, the rule was the stores could not open on Sunday until 1 o'clock. That way, everybody had a chance to go to church and go to lunch with their family and do whatever they wanted to do before they were at work at 1 o'clock if they had to be. But there was an exception in the law for retail. So you could do stocking and inventory and staff meetings and everything else on Sunday morning, and that was fine, and your employees had to show up for it. And there goes another hole in the Sabbath. So you and I who live in a largely Protestant culture which has wrestled with this idea for the past 500 years should really be asking ourselves, well, what good is the Sabbath? What should we, should we be doing with it? For this, I have a suggestion. It comes from the early church. You might imagine the church has always been like it, it was in the 19th century where you could barely lift a finger and, and have it look like work on the Sabbath. But it wasn't. <clears throat> in the early church, they went back and looked at the gospel and they see that Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. That meant the law didn't go away, but somehow it ought to be different if we're living in Christ, if we're living after the time of of, of the coming of Jesus and the proclaiming of the kingdom of God through the message of Jesus. So what did it mean then to live in the law in Jesus? Well, first they decided that this idea that there was one day a week with no work had been, had been abolished along with other things that observant Jews were still doing. We're just now beginning to read Acts at St. Thomas's the month, month of June. Soon you will begin to hear as they wrestle with this as the Jewish followers of Jesus begin to meet the Gentile followers of Jesus and have to decide, well, why aren't they eating the way we eat? Why do they not observe the Sabbath? Why don't they do the things that we do? They should do the things we do in order to be part of the club. And in the end, the church decided, no, that wasn't the way it was going to work. Well, there's both good news and bad news in that for us, dear friends, in the way that they decided they would interpret the Sabbath. The early church said that the Sabbath is about rest from sin and from self-justifying works. I'll say that again. The Sabbath is meant to be rest from sin and from self-justifying works. That might initially seem like an odd idea that sin is something you need to rest from. Certainly, we would all agree, I think, that sin is something you should stop doing, cease doing in some way, but the idea that you've got to rest up after you stop seems kind of strange, doesn't it? And yet the minute you start thinking about it, it becomes more and more apparent why that would be the case. I doubt that anyone in this room has ever hatched a criminal conspiracy. If you have, please don't tell me. But we've all seen them on TV and read about them in books and movies, and you can see how much work is involved just in doing anything you're not supposed to do. Sin is exhausting. How many times do we begin down some path that we know isn't quite the right one, only discover all of the other things that are, we are dragging along behind us once we make one decision that we shouldn't have made? It's attributed to Mark Twain. I hope he really said it. Uh, I tell the truth because it's easier to remember. There's considerable wisdom in that, dear friends. It becomes really, really tiring to haul around all of the consequences of all the bad choices that we make. How much easier it might be to lay that burden down and rest from it. It's true for us individually and it's true for us collectively as a Christian culture. <clears throat> How much energy have we Christianity expended in the past 2,000 years trying to make sure that we never heard from women, we never heard from racial and ethnic minorities, we never heard from anyone who disagreed with us, we never heard from anyone who didn't look like us, we never heard from anyone who wasn't from here 
however you choose to define that. What could we have done with all of that energy if we hadn't been wasting it in those ways? And not to ignore self-justifying works entirely, how much more energy would we have if we weren't trying to score points with God that don't make any difference anyway? I am vividly aware that I cannot save myself. There is nothing I can do in my life that will win my own salvation. So how much more time and energy will I have to try to live as a beloved child of God in the way that God intends if I'm not constantly trying to ring up more points in the heavenly ledger that I can't do anyway? How much better it might be to be able to rest from all of that? I could say amen and sit down, but I would not be satisfied if I were listening to me because my next question would be, okay, well, how do I do that? How many sermons have I sat through in my life thinking, well, tell me a little more, please? Maybe that's just justification on my part to go on longer, but take that for what it's worth. I have a couple of suggestions for what it might mean to rest from sin, how we do it, perhaps to challenge you and me to try it this week. The first and most obvious thing that we have to do is acknowledge sin. Name it for what it is. Sin is not a, a nice, clear, black and white sort of thing. It really is a slippery sort of continuum, spectrum. There's so many things that we say, well, I'll just do this once. It really isn't that bad. It, 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 white lie, whatever it's going to be. So important to be able to recognize in ourselves and in the world where sin is and to name it for what it is. The more we do that, the more we will see it. The more we see it, the more we can properly evaluate it and see how little it really does for us, for others, for the good of the universe. So the first thing to do is simply to look at our own lives and figure out where we are wasting our energy, to use that framework I've been talking about. It isn't necessarily about when we're you know, calling up demons to do our bidding. It's everything that goes on in our lives that is wasted energy, that draws us away from the path that God desires us to follow. So, first step, very simple. Find the sin, name it, recognize it, call it out every time we see it, particularly and especially in ourselves. The second piece is to repent. I was talking to one of my colleagues this week, last week, about a variety of things. For some reason, the subject of repentance came up in our conversation. That's what the clergy talk about when we're in our off hours. And his point was that repentance has come to be a little bit distorted in our modern culture, I think. Somehow we imagine that repentance is a, a perpetual sorrow. We, we're never, we never cease to be sorry for our sin. We kind of wallow in it where in reality, repentance is meant to be our turning in a new direction, setting down what the sin is, leaving it there behind us, and walking away in another direction. One of the hardest parts of my job is when someone comes to me for confession, and I have to tell that person and then convince that person that once a sin is confessed, it now belongs to God. It no longer belongs to us. It is now God's problem. We cannot hold on to it. We must set it aside and move on. Sometimes we do love our sins. We love to hold on to them. Apparently, we love to carry those burdens around with us. How much less weight would we have if we looked at repentance as that, the setting down of the burden? <clears throat> And yet it's so hard. What well, St. Paul says, our sin, sin that clings so closely to us. It holds on to us, we hold on to it. But if we're ever going to rest, we have to break that pattern. The third thing that we must do then is be thankful. To imagine that somehow this option is even open to us, that rest is even a possibility. 
I don't know about you, but how many days have I gone through where I couldn't do things that were supposed to be good for me, like rest or eat or stop and breathe, because I had so many things I had to get done, and the work just kept on pushing me on and pushing me on and pushing me on. How much better to recognize that that isn't necessary and to be grateful to God for the fact that that isn't necessary, that you and I have the option to hand all those burdens over, carry them no more, and spend our time in rest and the kind of renewal that God desires for each one of us. That then is the fourth step, renewal. It might be tempting to imagine that rest becomes a permanent state. All we do is become inert. We, we, we just stop doing everything. But no, the point of all this setting down of the unhelpful burdens is to pick up the much lighter weight of things that God desires for us both to do and to be in our lives. To take up the light yoke, the easy burden, as Jesus says elsewhere in the gospel, that is to be a follower of Jesus. So this is not about ending and stopping. It's about being rejuvenated, being re-energized, discovering what we can do if only we will let go of what isn't helping us. So there it is. There's the challenge, dear friends, for this week. Do you dare to rest from sin? Do you dare to rest from trying to prove to God that you are good enough and trust that, in fact, God has already taken care of those things for you? I dare you. Try it. You may be surprised. God is just waiting. Amen.